Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger, and we are talking today about Saul, the people's desire for a king like the nations. Um, I believe last week we talked about the birth of Samuel, um, who would be the one to anoint King Saul. Spoilers. Um, but how did how did that come about? That wasn't exactly something that God offered on a silver platter as, yes, this is what I have intended for my people Israel. It was kind of initiated from the grassroots, if you will. <laughs> you know, there would be a theme in itself that I hadn't thought about. We often have the idea of something comes from the grassroots and it's got to be good. <laughs> the people really wanted it. People really wanted it. Someone once said... The only time democracy is mentioned in the Bible is when Pilate gave the crowd a choice as to who he should <laughs> crucify, who he should let go, and they all chose Barabbas. The crowd always chooses Barabbas. Uh, our founding fathers were distrustful of um, the people, of popular government, and um America's been called a democracy so long now that we, we take it for granted, but that's not what it was supposed to be, it's not what anybody trusted. The Greek democracies were short-lived and uh, catastrophic by and large. And the reason has nothing to do with structure as such, and that's what we're going to see tonight, uh, because as the authors of the Federalist paper said, men are not angels. Mm -hmm. Really? <laughs> the <laughs> Bible was right? <laughs> wow. And that means that grassroots voting is no better than uh, elite voting uh, in and of itself. The question has to do with character, restraints on government and all that. Anyway, God had, in fact, promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that kings would come out of their loins. So that, somehow, someway, someday. Uh, in fact, uh, Jacob had said to Judah, uh, a lawgiver will not depart from Judah or the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come to him, shall the gathering of the people be. So the long-awaited hero, deliverer, savior would be a king. He'd bear a scepter. He'd be a lawgiver. But there's not a whole lot else. Uh, the prophet, the false prophet uh, Balaam spoke of a scepter arising out of Jacob. But again, not a lot of detail. But when we come to Deuteronomy, Moses does lay down rules that would govern the king. And interestingly enough, he says, when you come into the land and you want to set a king over you like all the nations, here's the kind of king you're, you're, you should want and have and pick. Uh, the problem was not, and that's the excuse they're going to use, we want a king like all the nations. Uh, depends what you mean by that. If you mean you want to have a government that most people are familiar with and that seems to serve most people's purposes, that's one thing. When you say, we want a king so we can be like the nations, that's a different emphasis and a different mm -hmm. issue. Yeah, and, and it's interesting that it's a king, it's an individual. You can look at all the different monarchies through history mm -hmm. and how they look at their king as their icon, you know? Yeah. I'm, yeah. Thinking, I'm thinking of my favorite, uh, Don Pedro II of Brazil, but he's not exactly <laughs> typical, so... Well, uh, funny, I was thinking of Alfred the Great, but he's not <laughs> thinking of the atypical kings, actually. Kings kings are not bad. Mm -hmm. The question is what kind of king, and what the law says, what Deuteronomy says, is he's going to be a king under law. It's Deuteronomy 17, and specifically the restrictions placed on the king. Well, first of all, he had to come from the covenant people, couldn't pull in a foreigner. No he, William of Orange going. No, no William of Orange <laughs> coming in. Apparently, no. Uh, there were um, three things that the king was not to multiply to himself. He was not to multiply horses. Those were the tanks, the offensive weapons of the day. Nothing. No. No restrictions on battlements and walls and such, because they're they're not going to your, your walls are not going to go out and start a war. <laughs> but your your horses might. And then um, a limitation on wives. They weren't to multiply wives themselves because wives for kings meant foreign alliances in those days. You, know, you, you married the, the daughter of the king of the neighboring nation so that you were all now one big happy family. And also if things went wrong, you had an automatic hostage. Little detail that wasn't actually put in the contract. <laughs> There's also wished. the whole polygamy thing. Yeah, there was that. That was right out. But 
And then um, the king was not to apply to multiply gold to himself. He was not to have a huge budget for what he was due because the law actually gave him very little to do. Defend the people, uh, preserve justice. It's not there to create a social welfare program or an education program or to manage the economy. Well, it's very simple and limited, and to this degree, our libertarian friends would be very happy <laughs> so far as they tolerate any kind of um, civil government at all. But when it came to such things, the king had tremendous power to act uh, and to deal with criminals and with invaders. So th those, those were restrictions. There was a positive requirement that the king was to write out a copy of the law mm. in his own hand. Uh, this was not a devotional exercise. This was a judicial exercise. He was supposed to master the law and write. By the way, it would, it would mean he had to actually be literate. Mm -hmm. And he could not pawn it off on somebody else. Hey, Sam, have you written out those chapters for me today? Is that my homework? You can't, you know, you've got, you've got to do it <laughs> Photocopy yourself. Photocopy this for me. <laughs> yeah, it, it does, that, that doesn't work. He has to, in that culture, writing it out meant that you had to process it, read it, have it pass through your brain and your hand and such. So he was to become intimately familiar with the law of God because that was his standard. So those are some of the things that were in place. And the question then becomes, well, if God knew that and intended to give Israel a king, what's the big deal when they finally ask for one? And it has to do with their attitude. This is what they say. They use an excuse that Samuel's sons aren't um, the man he is. Samuel had appointed them judges in Beersheba. Beersheba was the southern boundary. It'd be like, I don't know, what's the what's the last American city before you hit Tijuana? <laughs> I don't know, San Antonio or something? Yeah, well, you know, it's, it'd be some small, out-of-the-way place. Yeah. And they, they had very little effect on anything. But they weren't doing a great job. They were not acting, uh, walking in Samuel's ways. And the elders used that as an excuse. Now... Samuel has led great revivals in his time, but as we've seen, one of the problems with Israel throughout the book of Judges is, is perpetuating revival into the next generation. So although Israel had in some sense repented and God had driven back the Philistines and recovered the ark to them and, and uh, the battle of Mizpah had followed, Samson has done his work, God has been looking after Israel very clearly for some time and they've had peace. And yet now that Samuel's old, people are getting restless again. And but but what's the problem with the king? Well, they say, Behold, thou art old, thy son's walking out of my ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people, and all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they now also to thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall rule over them. The problem was not that they wanted a king under Yahweh, they wanted a king instead of Yahweh. Mm -hmm. Not that they simply wanted a more efficient um, civil government, more reliable, more predictable. Well, we could make good arguments for that. The, the whole judges things had been rather creative and interesting, although it allowed for a great deal of freedom. It also allowed for a great deal of being beat up by your enemies. Yeah, stability was not <laughs> the hallmark of the judges era. No, it's not. Um, and so God is saying, this is just one more thing. They're not going after an idol uh, in the traditional sense after false gods, but they are turning this idea of a monarch into an idolatry. Mm -hmm. uh, they want this king instead of me. And because that's what they want, that's what they're going to get. Uh, God says to Samuel, go ahead, make them a king. But this is the kind of king they're going to get. You tell them. And there is a list that follows. Here are some of the things that uh, Samuel told them out loud in front of everybody. This is what's going to mark your king. Your king's going to conscript your sons for military uh, and agricultural armies. He's going to conscript your daughters to work in his bakeries and kitchens. He's going to take the best of your lands, eminent domain, and distribute them to his lackeys. He's going to take their slaves for his own use. 
And he would take the tenth of their seed, of their vineyards, and their sheep. Now, the last point has to do with the tithe. God demanded the tenth of all these things. This And, and this was what marked God as their sovereign and their king. This was his tax. He paid 10%. There was, it wasn't something enforced by civil government, nor was it necessarily enforced directly by the ecclesiastical government, although I assume that your rabbi, pastor, Levite, after not seeing you do anything for a while, might walk over and say, hey, Zachariah, what's with this? Uh, we never seem to see tithes coming in for you. You know, they, this is this, and do that. I, I, presumably, you could uh, be excommunicated, but it would take a while. There was no mechanism set up to check on such things. You were not required to submit your books at the end of the year to the synagogue to see whether or not you were doing something. Again, great deal of room for freedom and for putting the burden on the individual to do what was right. But this is a highly symbolic number of yeah. one tenth shows that everything that I have belongs to God. And exactly. so giving one tenth indicates that he is my God. Yeah. And so for a king, a merely human king, to demand the same amount mm -hmm. was uh, idolatry. The king was taking the place of God. And to be told that he will and to be okay with that is, is great wickedness. On the other hand, to be told he will do that and say, oh, no, no king would ever do that. We in the 21st century can only sit back and laugh at that one. 10% oh, would be real nice. Oh, it would. It would be <laughs> nice to go back to 10%. I'm all about 10%. That'd be great. Um, I forget what the percentage was when the United Colonies uh, decided to break with Britain, but I think it was like 1% or 2% tops, the whole taxation rate. And even then, it wasn't so much the uh, tax burden as it was the principle involved. Parliament's taxing us directly, and they don't have the authority. Mm -hmm. But uh, if they knew then what's happened to their descendants, they would be horrified. At some point, maybe it was then horrified again. You I think it was FDR what? who proposed a hundred and I think a hundred and three percent income tax at one point. The idea being, if if you were in the top tax bracket, you obviously had savings, and the government had a right to it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All that to say, 10% sounds really nice today. It does, but... but at that point, it was symbolically a slap in God's face. So the Samuel warns the elders of all this, but they, and he says, uh, in, this is going to happen. And you'll cry out in that day because of your king, which you have chosen, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. It should are, be there, scary. It should be. You know, there are, there are some Christians who, who I'm sure mean well, who are patriots in the traditional American sense, the whole God and country thing. And as far as they can see, well, God disapproves of this kind of taxation. God approves of, disapproves of tyranny and all that. So, you know, God would not ever tolerate this or make use of it. Therefore, we are always justified in our rebellion against tyrants. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of hard to prove from Scripture and from God's own track record. First of all, God says, give them a king. Here's the kind of king you're going to give them. <laughs> Meaning that the king that gets there is legitimately king. He, is like legitimately he has a legitimate king. claim on these people. Yeah, and what God has said is going to happen, they have to deal with. They can't come back and say, oh, wait, uh, Surprise, surprise, you were right. He's 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 being our tyrant is being tyrannical. We should we should get rid of him or overthrow him or assassinate him. God's gonna say, mm, no. Well, God, you can intervene. Not going to. <laughs> Deal. You're right. I totally could. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Isn't that nice? I, I could, and, and I'm not going to. You're going to have to deal with this. Because what's basic here is who do you trust? Whom do you serve and whom do you trust? Is it earthly? processes, a uh, constitution, a republican form of government, a monarchy, an emperor, bureaucratic system. What? Where are you? Do you think that politics can save you? And far too often Christians have thought, well, yeah, that's how you fix things. You fix things with politics. And when you try to do the right thing, God will bless you and everything will come out all right. I'm sorry, that's not in scripture anywhere. What's in scripture is you chose to trust politics. Well, God's going to turn you over to politics for a while. And it may be a lot longer than you think. In fact, in this case, it was, well, until the collapse of the two kingdoms. <clears throat> God never took them back to Republican simplicity again. 
because God has far more important things to worry about than our form of government. And that, again, that's a shock <laughs> to some American Christians who are involved in politics. Well, isn't that the most important thing? Not to God. It's way down on the list. Yeah. Insofar as what the political choices we make reflect our faith in God and our commitment to his word, to that degree he's concerned. But the specifics, um, well, let's let's go on and find out a little bit more what happens to Saul. And some of these things perhaps will be a little clearer. So uh, we, we shift gears and we're introduced to a young man named Saul. About all we got going for him is he's really tall. He's from the tribe of Benjamin, which is the smallest of the tribes because of the massacre that happens at the end of the book of Judges. Um, and he, his father has lost some donkeys and Saul and his servant go looking for them and they can't find them. And finally, they decide they're going to go to Samuel because obviously a prophet of God would have time to be a, find a donkey service for these young men. Uh, we, we get the feeling that Saul is not really got it together spiritually, but meanwhile, God has come to Samuel and said, I'm going to send you the guy who's going to be king. When he comes, you anoint him. Well, Saul comes, meets Samuel. Samuel says, don't stop worrying about the donkeys. They're found, but you're the one we're concerned about. Why me? I'm nobody. I have, my family's nobody. My tribe's nobody. Yeah, well, come <laughs> on to the sacrifice. So they go to a sacrifice, and Samuel makes sure that Saul gets the best peace. Now, sacrifice, of course, is a peace offering. Uh, and Samuel is the one, as a prophet of God, who's offering it. And he's since the whole breakdown of the tabernacle structure, apparently it's okay at this point to offer sacrifices other than at the tabernacle. But by giving this this choice, this choice piece of meat to Saul, he's including him within his family or his close friends, his disciples. He's, he's trying to set things up to maintain, you're going to be king, I'm going to be your god uncle. <laughs> I'm going to be the guy who's going to be at your elbow giving you advice and talking to God, because this could go really bad, but it needn't. Uh, and so on the morning, um, Samuel anoints him. This is chapter 10 of First Samuel and sets a number of signs for him that will come upon him. And they do one by one. And one that's crucial, I think, for understanding what's going on here, we're told that he um, he meets some other prophets along his way who are singing and praising God with instruments of music and prophesying in the spirit. The spirit of the Lord comes upon Saul as well. And he begins to prophesy. That is, he speaks God's word by inspiration. So this is a good thing. Uh, our king is apparently a son of the prophets now. But someone in the crowd who sees this makes, well, a, a number of people say, is Saul also among the prophets? Doesn't sound encouraging. It's not like, wow, I knew he had it in him. I knew God had had his hand on him. I knew God had great things for this man. It's like, Saul, really? <laughs> not, 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 not a good thing. And someone quips, but who's their father? That is, who leads and, and sets the agenda for the prophets? Well, in heaven, it would be God. Mm -hmm. On earth, it would be Samuel. Is that what this means? Does this mean that Saul has been changed to such an extent that he will be, as it were, a prophetic king. That'd be great. But it doesn't sound like the people who know Saul are convinced yet. Uh, we it's are told... Go ahead. A funny line is Saul to be numbered among the prophets. I think, especially working with kids who are uh, learning to flex their logical <laughs> rhetorical muscles. Yes. It's like, I will make this impenetrable logical proof. He prophesied, therefore he is a prophet. Yeah. But we can all look at that and say, no, no, it's not, you know, the, because something is true in one sense doesn't make it true in another more important sense. Yeah, the more important sense. And speaking of more important senses, we're told that when Samuel left Saul, God gave him another heart. And, you know, that sounds like regeneration on the surface. <laughs> if there were nothing else, it would be easy to take it to mean that. But the further we read into Saul's life, the less and less evidence we see of anything that smacks of the fruit of the Spirit. In fact, he is demon-possessed for a while, or at least demon-oppressed. And so what it means, apparently, is simply that Saul goes from being kind of a, a shy, retiring goofball to being someone to be reckoned with, someone forceful, someone who can command men and 
And he has a new role battle. and a new identity. Yeah, which is fine as far as it goes. Mm-hmm. So that's going on. Saul goes home. He doesn't tell his dad what happened. Uh, just, just a skeleton outline of, yeah, I talked to him, and he said the donkeys were found. But Samuel calls the people together in Mizpah yet again and um, says this, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all kingdoms and them that oppressed you. I have been your savior. I ought to be your ruler. And you have this day rejected your God, who himself saved you out of all your adversities and tribulations. You have said nay, but set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourselves by your tribes. And so they cast lots. Now, Saul, all, I mean, Samuel already knows the outcome, but the rest of Israel is is completely ignoring what Samuel just said. <laughs> you have rejected God, your Savior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can we get on to choosing the king thing? So he does. And the lot falls on Benjamin, and then the family within that, the family with it, until it shows up on Saul, who does not seem to be there. So they actually ask God, is he here or are we still waiting on him? And the Lord answered, behold, he hath hidden himself among the stuff, baggage. <laughs> and they, they run and they fetch him. And when he stood among the people, he was higher than any of the people from the shoulders and upwards. And Samuel said to all the people, see ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. Um, and all of the people shouted and said, God save the king, or let the king live. Interesting. I, I hadn't really thought about this first a great deal before. Look at him. See him. Mm-hmm. There's none like at him. There's none like him. Visually, there is no one like him. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> but God looks at the heart. <laughs> God looks at the heart. Is something he will tell us later on when it's time to anoint David. He, Samuel... When he says to the people, see him whom the Lord has chosen, there's none like him. He's taller than everybody. Doesn't that make him a great king? (laughs) You would think there'd be somebody there who would say, yeah, but what are his credentials? What's his track record? Can we talk to his rabbi? Uh, What's what's his testimony? What's his work record? Uh, Has he stood for uh, theological confirmation? I mean, all of the questions you could ask. And yet when Samuel simply says, look at him, He's taller than everybody. Nobody (laughs) sees the absolute absurdity in that. And they're all just excited. Uh, In the original article I wrote for this, I started with uh, the story of uh, William Harding. Warren. Warren, Warren. I'm sorry, Warren Harding, sorry. Who was one of our presidents, who no one remembers now, including me, apparently. Um, (laughs) He came right before Coolidge, right? Hmm. Like, like <laughs> Which said, means nothing really, happened because everything was great. So. Everything was great, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Malcolm Gladwell in his book Blink spent some time about with that election and basically argues that people knew nothing about him. He really had nothing to commend him. I mean, there's nothing special. There were lots of people who had his credentials. Uh, but because he was tall and handsome, taller than the average American, carried himself well, dressed well, was handsome – that that one in the presidency calls it the Warren Harding effect. And it's not dissimilar here to what we're seeing in Saul. And of course, ever since then, and more and more with the invention of television, mm-hmm. Americans have been captured by image. It's going to say know, JFK. <laughs> yeah, J, say JFK. Say JFK versus uh, Richard Nixon. Uh, in their debate, interesting thing, we're told that people who saw it on TV said that Kennedy won hands down. People who heard it on radio without the accompanying images said that Nixon won. Mm-hmm. But since more people were watching on TV, JFK got the uh, got the election because people more and more want someone handsome and trendy and cool and suave and with it and all those kind of things. And so we've now gotten to the point in America where uh, three seconds of showing your candidate looking really good, handsome, beautiful, whatever, is all you want. You really don't want them opening their mouth much. Our current president has been criticized more times than anything else, not for how he looks or even for how old he is, but for the things he said. <laughs> not not measured against um, a Republican standard, but simply measured against common sense and anybody's standards. 
Everyone shut him up. Someone put a car. Get him off the stage. Get him off the stage. Yeah. The last president was get him off Twitter. Get him off Twitter. Well, yeah. This one is like, no, just don't let him talk to anyone. Don't let him talk to anybody. I mean, he, he looks like a nice old guy. He's a grandfatherly type just to look at him. And, and the angles you photograph somebody are very important. If you want to photograph somebody you don't like, you kind of get underneath his nose and go up. <laughs> if you want to make him look good, you shoot more downward or slightly profile. And, and so the roots of this are, are ancient. They're, they're in the heart of man because what we're talking about is image. Image is visual perception. Uh, we make images. We make idols and icons. But we also make celluloid images and paintings and photographs and all kinds of things. And we are not forbidden to do all of these things, but we are warned in Scripture over and over again that interpretation has to accompany image. We have to be told what's going on here. Because when we're not, then the image is left with simply its sensual visual impact, which is emotional and touches us hormonally more often than it does intellectually. One of the, one of the many reasons it's not supposed to be used, those such things are not supposed to be used in worship. But I, I have seen, and this maybe this is just a, a me getting old. I don't know. I know when I was young, I took lots and lots of pictures. When I got married, I stopped. I took a few of our children. And then really, I just gave up on cameras and such. And, and I've begun to distrust people who have lots of pictures around. And I'm not saying it's wicked. I'm just saying that there's you, 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 there needs to be some judgment here. Uh, why do I want to look at my children when they were little? Oh, to remember those good old days. I'm fine with the present good days. <laughs> I don't need to remember everything that's happened in the past. Again, that's, that's my personal uh, call on this. But I think there is a danger in, in surrounding ourselves with uninterpreted images. It's so one thing if you could say, well, I put this in because this happened in such and such a time, in such and such a place, when such and such things were happening. And you remember the story that goes with this? Okay. <laughs> now, it, now it's doing something. You've attached uh, some weight to that picture. Today yeah. with the camera phones, I find it more common that people of my generation have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pictures that they've taken the time to take. There's yeah. an effort put into taking the pictures. And rarely do they go back and ever look at them again. It's an obsession with making what is in front of us into an image without yeah. ever attaching utility to that image. And perhaps it's something we should talk about uh, on another time. I, at this point, I will just point out that it's interesting and that there are potential dangers. And so I say it's with any kind of technology. Every technology right. brings with yeah. it some sort of danger. And we need to be aware of that and, and figure out what we're going to do about that to avoid the potential danger, whether it be fire or nuclear energy or a handgun or books, all, or, books or podcasts. Mm -hmm. there, there are potential dangers. And just to absorb the next technology, particularly when it's something as powerful as images, without thoroughly thinking through it theologically and morally, is... To walk out on quicksand, I think. Uh, it may be that there's this just perfect Indiana Jones-like path right through the quicksand. <laughs> if you just know where to step or accidentally hit the right steps. But uh, How I, many I people have to fall through before we find that path? Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe we could not do that. Maybe we could actually <laughs> consider why we're doing it and what we're doing. I, I know for our own church, it's been something of a challenge. We were working on uh, presenting... Uh, not just the pastor, but the whole service online images. Mm -hmm. Now, for shut ins from our own congregation who legitimately cannot come to church because they are physically disabled and can't come, there is much potential good here because they get to see friends and hear the word of God in a highly crafted, is not the word, but I'll take it, uh, uh, context. Mm. And but but they know I, I know these people I, I know what's going on I, I, they they can they can they can deal with it but to what extent do we want to convince people that no this is just like church well no it's not <laughs> it, it's a solution of sorts for people who really physically can't get there but there are real dangers here and we've seen them in the wake of COVID people who are still content to 
watch church and think that because they see it and hear it, that's all that matters, right? And the Gnostic ding uh, implications for uh, our understanding of our own humanity are tremendous. And 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 so in the political realms, we should probably get back to to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We see these images of people, and we don't register these are images. Uh, no, I saw it with my own eyes. No, you saw a very, a very carefully crafted image of something that's been edited, photographed from a particular angle, a particular time, it's gone through some, uh, editing software, uh, released under certain circumstances with certain background music. You were not there. You did not see it. You do not know what happened. But since things believing, we convince ourselves that this is okay. And I don't know how many people said the most ridiculous things about a previous president just based on a song, a, a soundbite here or there, a visual clip. Uh, I'm sure uh, President Trump had his flaws. <laughs> um, but I, I, know a guy, I know a guy who was one step away from the cabinet. I mean, he talked to the president fairly regularly uh, and, and could come and tell me Privately, always with the condition of, okay, the media cannot know this is going on, but, <laughs> um, you know, what were some of the things that were happening in the background? Like, this president's doing some awfully great things. He's mm -hmm. dealing some serious blows to the extreme left for whatever that's worth. But, you know, one soundbite, one image is enough to just tell people, no, he's a horrible man. This other guy who looks kindly and gently and probably needs to be at a rest home, he looks so much nicer. <laughs> and this is and this is what's happening here. The people see Saul, and he and, and basically we're told we're not even told particularly that he's good looking. We're told that he's taller than everybody else, which probably means around seven feet, give or take. And that's going to be ironic later because when Goliath shows up. <laughs> he's even taller, and that's he's his only claim to fame. <laughs> and the only thing, and the, the, the one person who should go out and face him, first, because he's king, and secondly, because he's the tallest guy around, would be Saul, and Saul's in his tent shivering. Because <laughs> height is not much of anything, honestly. <laughs> so funny. Uh, I never thought about that. They've pinned their hopes on this person because he's so tall. Then yeah. along comes somebody taller. Someone End taller. Of hope. <laughs> yeah, that is it. And it's interesting that no one points this out to Saul. Even David does. And David, of course, has some tact and wisdom. It doesn't say, sire, you're the tall one. Why aren't you out there? He, he realizes that this is a matter of faith. But that's we'll talk about Saul and David another day. Well, the uh, we're told that Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. So it's going to be a constitutional monarchy. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we would all love to have a copy of that constitution, but we don't because it was for that time and that place under those particular circumstances. And I, apparently God assumes that if we're smart enough to come up and holy enough and godly enough to come up with a form of government that's going to please, be pleasing to him, we can figure out details easily enough. There are so many things that don't really matter and so many things that so obviously matter, see the Ten Commandments, that we don't need a photocopy of that one. We can come up with our own. The principle that there was such a thing, even when God ordained it, is important. Mm -hmm. That God ordained this should be a constitutional monarchy, not an absolute monarchy. But as to what yeah. the restraints were beyond what was already in the law, we're not told it doesn't matter. The Magna uh, Carta was not the OG constitution. No. And, uh, <laughs> and how many people have actually read the Magna Carta? I have, and it's boring. Yes. Because... <laughs> If you go back expecting to see lots of uh, Jeffersonian um, language and sloganeering and such, and it's not at all. There's a little <laughs> bit up front, but mostly it just, okay, here's what the king's going to keep his hands off from now on. And a lot of the words we don't even use anymore, like, what is that anyway? <laughs> but Saul goes home, and God has touched the hearts of some people who go with him to be kind of his servants and his his guys, his cabinet, whatever they become, being with others, some wicked people. Interestingly enough, the wicked see through this. Um, the children of Belial said, how shall this man save us? They despised him and brought him no presents. Well, you know what? They're right. This man can't. Mm -hmm. And when uh, unbelievers point at uh, a conservative president and say, well, what can this guy do for us? Well, not a whole lot, actually. <laughs> 
he's certainly not going to save us. Mm -hmm. um, and when President Trump was on his way out, when it looked like the voting was going to favor a man who got the office, I had one guy come up to me in church and said, I believe that President Trump is going to lead us through this. He's like a Joshua leading us through Jordan. I'm with him on his side. God's going to turn this around and do something incredible and great revival is going to... That did not happen. Mm -hmm. but uh, And you hope that was not a great blow to that man's faith? I hope not. I doubt it. But I'm sure he was uh, very disappointed for a while and probably wondered how he got things so wrong. I would hope that much at least. But the critics have said, yeah, he's, what's so great about Well, you know, there's nothing great about any human ruler. Some are better mm -hmm. than others. Some are better in some ways and worse than others. But... The, the whole point here is that politics don't save us. Human rulers don't save us. Presidents, Supreme Court justices don't save us. And this is hard for political activists sometimes to get a hold of. Uh, might, might some bit of political activism be really important right now in the moment? Yeah, sure. But it's not the equivalent of revival, and it's not the equivalent of turning everything in around. It's not the, you know, if, if you're in a firefight and someone's shooting at you and someone manages to take away one of the guys with the gun just before he's about to blow, blow your brains out, you're very thankful to that man for having done so. You're still in the middle of a firefight. There's still a lot of people out to get you. And uh, it's not all over because of what one person does. Chapter 11 of First uh, Samuel. Saul's first real challenge comes up. An Ammonite king named Nahash, which is the equivalent of the word for serpent, shows up and comes to uh, Jabesh Gilead, that's on Trans Jordan, and uh, corners them and lays siege to them. And they, they say, all right, well, yeah, we've lost. What do you want? Uh, well, I'll make a covenant with you. I'll make a peace treaty. If I, you let me thrust out all your right eyes, which would mean, since you're holding a shield that covers your left eye, you basically are no longer capable of fighting on the battlefield. He could have picked other things, but he picked that. And they say, well, give us seven days, and we're going to send messengers all through Israel to call for help. And interestingly enough, the king says, sure, fine, go for it. Doesn't, <laughs> doesn't stop. I, for one, would have said, oh, yes, let them come, and then killed them all. But... Well, this guy apparently was so so convinced of his superiority, and he figured nothing's going to come of this. Let them go. Well, the message comes to Saul. Saul's out plowing in the field. You can think here of, of George Washington, who wanted to do nothing, <laughs> wanted nothing more than to go back to his farming. He didn't want to be president. Uh, or Cincinnati, in Roman tradition. But uh, the spirit of God comes upon him, and so here we have the spirit of God again. <laughs> And he takes his oxen and hews them up and sends them throughout the coast of Israel and says, this will be done to anyone's oxen that doesn't follow after. Saul and Samuel, he includes Samuel there for a little bit of wait, does a forced march, gets to Jabesh, and destroys the Ammonite armies. And suddenly everybody is back on, on Saul's side. Shall, who were the men that said, Saul, shall, shall Saul reign over us? Bring them in. We may put them to death. And Saul's very magnanimous. There shall not a man be put to death this day. For today the Lord hath wrought salvation in Israel. Samuel says, let's go to Gilgal and the kingdom there. So they go through the sacrifices and the promises. And yet, and yet, in the midst of what seems to be revival, this is chapter 12, Samuel does this summary to Israel. Behold, I've hearkened unto your voice in all that you said unto me, and have made a king over you. Behold, now the king walketh before you, I'm old and gray-headed, and behold, my sons are with you. And I have walked before you from my childhood unto this day. Behold, here am I, witness against me before the Lord, before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose ass have I taken? Who have I... Basically, have I done anything unethical as judge, as a civil ruler? If, they, if I've done it, if I've stolen anything, cheated anybody, tell me now, I'll, I'll face the music. Let me know before retirement so I can yeah. make it right. I can make it right. And they say, no, you haven't defrauded us or oppressed us. The Lord's and his anointed as witness. Yeah, they, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Then he recounts their history of how God brought, God brought them up out of Egypt by the hand of Moses and Aaron. And, and, and goes along those lines and taught, rehearses some of the judges and how God delivered them again and again throughout that time period. And when you saw Nahash, the king of the children of Israel, and this is something we weren't told earlier. When you saw that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, came against you, you said, Nay, 
but a king shall reign over us. So there was a, there was a precipitating factor because mm-hmm. Nahash was already out there as a threat. And although he had not struck Jabesh yet, he'd probably been doing some stuff and make it, been making some noise. He might've been a new king on the throne saying, Israel's the great threat. He was wiped from the face of the earth. Follow me and whatever. And so behold the king whom you've chosen and whom you've desired. Behold the Lord. The Lord has set a king over you. Keep coming back to that again and again. God set not just a king generically. He set this king over you. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as it was against your fathers. And it's supposedly wheat harvest. It's supposed to be wheat harvest, but it stops being wheat harvest when God sends thunder and rain and wipes out their harvest. And they say, uh, pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God that we die not, for we have added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. Finally, (laughs) and Samuel says, fear not, you have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve him with all your heart. Turn ye not aside, for then you should go after vain things which cannot profit and deliver, for they are vain. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his name, great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. And, and he goes on these lines. Now, here's, here's the thing. He gets them finally to admit that asking for, the, for a king, at least on these terms and along these lines, with his heart attitude, it's sin. It's rebellion. They finally say, yes, we've sinned. It's part of our track record. It's rebellion. God does not say, then get rid of the stupid king thing. <laughs> Yeah. He doesn't tell them to go backwards. He says, start out where you are. All right. So you've got a king. I'm not taking the king away. Nor does he say that the things he prophesied would not happen. They, in fact, have been prophesied and they're going to happen. Just a question of how long and on what terms. But he gives them hope. If you and your king will obey me from this point forward, if you will trust me rather than yourselves, rather than your politics, rather than your military, rather than your clever political strategies, if you will trust me, then it will be well with you and I will bless you and we'll walk together. But if you don't, you know what's coming. Now, there are political ramifications here, but let me point out the personal ones. There are many times in life when we get to the point where we realize we've done a lot of really stupid, sinful things. Woman marries a non-Christian husband has children, realizes one day the guy is a complete creep, he's evil, he's dangerous, she has no money, she's got nothing, and she turns back to God. And God does not say at that point, well, first of all, divorce your husband, and then disown your children, and then go back and live with your parents, because it all started when you turned your back on them, and go back to the same church where you should. He doesn't do that. He says, to judge from this, all right, but from this day forward, you're going to do what's right. Mm-hmm. Now that even may, says in First Corinthians, your children are holy. Yeah, and you don't know whether, by your witness, your unbelieving spouse will come to Christ. As long as there is not some kind of legally prosecutable abuse, I will leave it at that. Because danger. I, so, yeah, <laughs> danger in some sense. I'll leave. I'll leave it at that. That's a discussion in itself. Yeah. Just just because he's not a Christian, he makes fun of your Christianity. It's not grounds for walking away. Mm-hmm. Just because he's not a nice person is not grounds for walking away. Just because he criticizes your housemaking or your parenting skills is not grounds for walking away. Uh, it doesn't, God does not say, go, just drop the whole thing, give him the children, because they're already tainted by this. They wouldn't exist if you hadn't sinned, so you must give them. God does not do any of that. God just says, all right, but from this day forward, you're going to walk with me, and you're going to deal with the consequences of sinful actions. But if you walk with me, then this... From here on out, my mercy will be sufficient. My grace will be sufficient for you. And and you can walk in blessing. That's a great comfort in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Because if we look back on our lives and say, how many things would I have to fix? <laughs> right. how, far back, how far back would I have to go? How many things would I have to undo? I'm left um, with nothing. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, and, and, and so once again, grace. Plus nothing, faith plus nothing, clinging to Christ plus nothing. And and that means even as a nation, then, the point is not that before God will have us back, we need to 
abolish certain cabinet offices and reduce the tax burden and get the federal government out of this, that, and the other thing and get rid of all Return the, the land to the Indians. Or, yeah, all those. Yes, exactly. All of those things. There, now, there may be a point and place and time for each of them. But we don't have to do all that before God's willing to take us seriously. What there needs to be is a recognition of our own absolute failure, of our own sin. And uh, calling upon God and clinging, clinging to God that says, you are our salvation. You are our way out of this. We will not trust in princes any longer. Mm -hmm. uh, the hand of flesh cannot save us. And we will do whatever we have to do, but we are, we are on your side now. We, you, you've saved us. We will be loyal. And we'll figure everything else out. And from that point on, God can bless an imperfect nation because you know what? There's nothing but imperfect nations. There's nothing but imperfect governmental systems. Nothing but imperfect politics. Salvation is not by fixing the political system. Salvation is by confessing that whatever we got, we got here largely because of our sins. Yes, there was there was grace. There was God's common goodness at points. There were Christian principles. There was Christian capital that we borrowed and burned up. That comes a point where we have to start over. We have, but starting over doesn't mean starting everything over. <laughs> let's go. Let's just abolish all civil government and then try from scratch. That's not a good idea. <laughs> uh, it really isn't. Baby bathwater. Yeah, baby bathwater. Inventing wheel again. Uh, we we begin where we should, and as I said earlier. Uh, the monarchy never goes away. In fact, in the person of David, God is going to transform it mm -hmm. into a vehicle for bringing Christ into the world, at least in part. But yeah, then the monarchy under the sons of David goes crazy, and God eventually sort of discards it too. And there's this whole virgin birth thing. And yet through the entire thing, you know, we have still the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, kings yeah. will come forth out of your loins. And that's a good thing. Yeah. You know, it's not as though monarchy itself is a curse. It's yeah. that God's monarchy is a blessing. <laughs> yeah. Human monarchy brings with it a lot of disaster. Yeah. And, and God is pleased to call his people kings and priests to God, mm -hmm. not presidents and uh, pastors. Because <laughs> yeah. Prophet, the, the, king, and priest. Yeah. The words do mean something. They do carry biblical connotations. And where it has been good insofar as we have de deified these things, that we do not believe in a um, divine right of kings or divine right of pastors, for that matter, mm -hmm. or the divine right of church government. Yet these are things God has ordained and we need to submit to them. Uh, anarchy is just a great ascent of totalitarianism. It's just even more trouble because at least totalitarianism has an order of some sort. I know people, <laughs> no, anarchy is better. You have not lived through anarchy. Thank you. <laughs> Besides, it just never stays. People will demand order and they'll get it. And our God is a God of order. Mm. We have the, you know, it comes back to who's around you and how do you relate to them? Your family has an order. Your neighborhood yeah. has an order. Relationships are structured by nature because we are covenantal beings. Yeah. Idolatry is an obsession with an image. It's a rejection of reality. Saul's image was impressive, and for a time, God used him powerfully. God, God knew Saul's heart. In time, the reality would eclipse the image. Saul would prove, indeed, to be a king like those of the nations round about. He would be a tyrant, a murderer, and worse. He would try to kill the Lord's Messiah. God says, I gave thee a king in my anger, took him away in thy wrath. You know, Israel's basic problem wasn't a political structure or a weak military or a lack of leadership. Israel was under the righteous judgment of God, and the only solution was sincere repentance. And that's where America stands. And we, we're good at gimmicks, and even the church is really good at gimmicks. One, one last program that will fix everything, whether it be religious or political or some blend of the two, and it's no substitution for mass revival of people as individuals coming to God and saying, I have sinned, forgive me, change me, and I will serve you. Even if it means serving you in the midst of tyranny and disaster and persecution. Uh, we don't get to set the conditions for God, but God is good. And in his time, he will accomplish that which is best for his people. He always says what's best for his people. We like to set conditions on God because we like to be comfortable, mm -hmm. especially we in America. Yeah.
I hear the protests already, but America isn't Israel. Correct. That makes it worse because yeah, we can look worse. back on Jesus <laughs> and say, yeah, that's the king we were supposed to serve. <laughs> yeah, that's the king we're supposed to serve, and we're not. And there's this thing called the uh, Great Commission where we're supposed to make all nations as disciples. Yeah, we, we need to get back to that one. And that means that as nations, we have to confess Christ as king. Yeah, that means at some point we have to have little things in the Constitution that says, and you will take this oath in the name of the triune God of Scripture. Uh, <laughs> Not basic, nature and nature's God? Yeah, and, uh, or some God never named. Mm -hmm. uh, the basic tests can be imposed, like, do you believe in the creator God? Do you believe the Bible is his word? Do you believe in the last judgment? The original colonies and the original states' governments had those things in their charters and in their first constitutions. Mm -hmm. uh, the American Constitution was unique in leaving them out, and the only parallel is the French Constitution up to that point. Uh, nobody could conceive of a nation who served no God in particular, uh, except perhaps here, Israel. Because for once, they didn't call for an idol. They just called for a king. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's some lessons that we need to listen to. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's wrap up with some recommendations. Um, I have a children's book to recommend. Okay. It was sent to me today by a dear friend, and I had never heard of it before, but it is utterly charming. It's called Chrysanthemum. And it's about a little Aww. mouse. His name is Chrysanthemum. And she goes to school and all the kids make fun of her because she's named after a flower. Yes. They're like, Chrysanthemum? Psh, lame. And her name doesn't even fit on her name tag. How weird is that, right? <laughs> but uh, it has a happy ending. And it's, yeah, I was utterly pleased with it. So, Chrysanthemum. It was the perfect name. Yes. Oh, so you know it. <laughs> I remember it being read aloud by a small girl a long, long, long time ago. Mm -hmm. So I haven't heard of it in years. Well, since you're going to deal, do that, I'm going to suggest something equally or actually even less uh, overpowering. <laughs> um, Sandra Boynton's, but oh. not the hippopotamus. Yes. Sandra <laughs> Boynton is the queen of children's books. She is. I assume she's a Christian. Because not the hippopotamus, and see, there's not the hippopotamus, there's going to bed book, and I think there's one other, uh, is about, it's just cutely drawn animals, and it's a board book, and it's very simple. But as you watch one of them, remember, if it's not the hippopotamus, there's going to bed book, you notice that these, in fact, are the animals on the ark. Oh, my goodness. Yep. Um, but uh, they're, they're just fun little books to read. And pleasant to look at in an age where so many children's books are are horrific with their mm -hmm. illustrations, ugly, gross, mm -hmm. uh, something that's just this sweet, mildly repetitive after a poetic fashion, pleasant, and that it was, there is just this, this there's, there's a faint moral message of uh, including everybody in your group and not pushing people away, not even the hippopotamus. <laughs> it's a good thing. I mean. You know, Lewis said that if, if it's a good book, children and adults should both be able to enjoy it. And I've read some of these little board books to my children when they were little over and over again. And I never grew tired of them because although they're simple, it's the simplicity of a simple but, but powerful poem. Mm -hmm. And there were many other books. I think we've talked about some of them before. The Story of Ping, White Mulligan's Steam Shovel, The Little House. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, make way for ducklings. <laughs> yeah. uh, there are beautiful children's books out there that, though they are sometimes imaginative, and they're usually imaginative, they do because they make the animals somewhat human. Um, they show God's creation as a beautiful thing to enjoy uh, and, and to take pleasure in and to appreciate. And this is much more much more value than a lot of the trash that appears as children's literature today. So maybe maybe at some point we can do a, a series on our favorite children's books for really little children. <laughs> yeah. When I come back from maternity leave and have some more go. informed opinions on this subject. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, Sandra Boynton is also super skilled in her musical writing. I don't know if you've listened to her uh -huh. album. No, I have not. Blue Moo. <laughs> so it's a bunch of songs written in different styles and totally riffing on different bands from today and from yesteryear before the Honorable Davy Jones 
of the monkeys passed away. <laughs> uh, he recorded a song called uh, "Your Personal Penguin." I want to be your personal penguin. <laughs> and of course, you can you can get each of these songs as a standalone children's book, but they also there are recordings, and you can mm. get the whole album. And that is my favorite song. It's my personal penguin. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been a delight. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Um, thank you to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. Uh, if you'd like to get a hold of us, the best way to do that is by sending us an email at haltingtowardsion at gmail.com. Thank you also hugely to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. Um, if you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash haltingtowardsion. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.